you mentioned this in the bio of like hipster content that is like ironically bad aesthetic. Tell us a little bit, like unpack that concept for us and, and why it bothers you. It all started with, you know, I feel like DSLR revolution where people, you know, had access to a camera. They could shoot video with a very short lens. So you could have like really beautifully shot footage with zero emotion. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a live game show to win big. As designers, we pitch great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher-ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your skills by assembling a brand-inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you could be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives, where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in The Perfect Match, and just submitting an entry gets you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and get ready to bring your design skills to win. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with founder and executive creative director of Attaboy Studios, Vikal Parikh. Influenced by his unique background in architecture, Vikal has spearheaded breathtaking mixed media narratives for some of the world's top tier brands. These include the likes of Facebook, Adidas, HBO, Microsoft, White Castle, and more. With the increasing surge in animation due to the limitations and inaccessibility of live action filming, he predicts that COVID may have signaled the end of what he calls hipster content, expensively produced imagery designed with an ironically bad or archaic aesthetic, and the return of more character and storytelling driven compositions. He's most excited about the potential for the tight integration of real time CG with live action. And I want to dig into that a little bit in this conversation. In his free time, Bickle can be found playing for the Hoboken Cricket Club, goofing around with his three kids and listening to some high energy Bollywood music. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Vickle Parik. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, please welcome Vickle Parik. Vickle, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thank you for having me, Josh. Hey, I always love to start with origin stories and it sounds like you've got an interesting one. Um, tell us how we're finding you here in this world of design and CG and animation and live act. Like that's quite the combo. So I want to hear how you found yourself in this world. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, not unlike a lot of people in our industry, uh, we sort of meandered through our artistic explorations and land in this uh, world of what I call storytelling. Um, for me personally, started off with uh, architecture and, uh, you know, I professionally trained as an architect in Mumbai. Uh, and, uh, you know, following that, I went to Savannah College of Art and Design to pursue my master's in fine arts. And the only goal of that was to integrate more design sensibility within the built form and how we can explore. I was very interested in how you can explore various organic forms uh, within sort of the built uh, aspect of architecture. And that's what really led me to the course. But then, uh, you know, eventually, uh, over there, I, I, you know, I think the way the program was structured was very open. Uh, it was like you could take classes in, um, you know, different. You could take a graphic design class. You could take a filmmaking class. You could take an animation course. And I think that really uh, sort of helped me understand my um, uh, affinity towards, you know, storytelling and using, uh, you know, digital um, forms, pixels, shapes. Uh, to 
create this sort of storytelling, um, which was more back in like 2000, it was more like thought of in terms of filming something, or if you were, you know, shooting something with a camera, editing it together, and then it made a story, uh, you know, using motion design or animation wasn't as much of an influence back then. So uh, that really was my first foray into animation. Up until then, I'd never even touched Photoshop. So <laughs> it was quite quite interesting um man then, i love savannah and i want my kids to get scholarships to go there so i have an excuse to go to savannah regularly in my uh <laughs> in my old age man like coming from mumbai and you know how busy that city was and then landing in savannah where time just kind of stood still and it took me a minute to mm-hmm. sort of, you know uh, you know, level set with that pace of life. But once you did, it was, you know, very blissful. And, uh, you know, really it's a very conducive place for students. I really think that the setting has more to do uh, to the education and how you, uh, you know, can dedicate more time towards what you're doing, explore. Um, yeah, I think the setting has a lot to do with beautiful city. Do you feel like uh, grad school is the right move for most creatives? in this space, you know, it, I hear mixed messages and I'm, I'm just curious, obviously you did it. I'm just kind of curious your take and your thoughts on who that's a good fit for. Uh, for me, it was more about learning, you know, whether you did it in grad school or did it as an internship at a company, uh, it really didn't matter much, but it was more about exploration and learning more. Um, I unfortunately could not find a place where I could gain that experience without spending money. Um, And so I went to grad school and uh, (laughs) that sort of gave me a platform to sort of experience these, uh, you know, different, uh, let's say, walks of design, whether it's graphic design or filmmaking or, you know, architecture or motion design. Um, You know, you could experience it, soak it in and be with, you know, people um, that sort of think uh, the way you think and are open to exploration and collaboration. Um, so that 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 is my take on it. I think I hugely benefited from that because at that point I was a little more mature in my thinking as well. So the naivety had died off and, you know, you're thinking about design, you're thinking about what you're learning, storytelling, or how you're expressing yourself uh, with a little more well-rounded approach to life uh, rather than, you know, just uh, when you're in college, I think there are a lot of distractions. You're, you know, as a person, you're sort of just, you know, coming to be yourself. So, Mm -hmm. you know, exploring the design aspect is, you know, it happens for a lot of people, but it didn't really happen for me. So for me, I had to, you know, sort of get that out of my system and then, you know, focus on uh, what really appealed to me. So I'm curious what led you to launching your own studio? Uh, that's, the, you know, I have to say my wife, uh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, worked at this company, uh, for called red car, which unfortunately does not exist, but, uh, you know, forged a lot of meaningful relationships and really gave me the platform to learn how to interact with clients, to understand what they really need, you know, how to cater to this commercial aspect of, design and animation and advertising per se. And, uh, you know, I found that I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the fact that I could be outgoing. I could, you know, talk to people, uh, you know, try to understand or really dig in deeper as to what they really want rather than what they're saying they want and to deliver that, uh, you know, for them. Because at the end of the day, advertising is the most commercial form of art. I would say, you know, you're taking art for a very particular reason is to sell, whether it's an image or a product. And uh, just to, you know, hear it from the clients themselves or even, you know, partners and creative directors at agencies. So once once I got through that, I, you know, had this entrepreneurial itch that, um, you know, I want to try and do it four projects that I'm most passionate about as opposed to just whatever walks in the door. And if you're working for a company, then, you know, uh, well, that's where the naivety comes in. Like you're like, well, I'm working with someone, so I'm 
doing everything I have to do what, you know, they're asking me to do. Whereas if I had my own studio, I could be selective uh, about the jobs that come in. Um, but, you know, having Ad, uh, having started Adboy, I really found my passion in combining architecture and um, design and animation and storytelling. Um, and I was able to take those risks and luxury of, you know, picking and choosing projects to work on and really, you know, making a portfolio that is quite unique. Like it's so varied with character animation, with live action, with, you know, sculptures, with, uh, you know, stop motion animation. I think that just having your own studio gave me the luxury to do that. Yeah. I love what you're saying about being intentional about the kind of work that you get. It reminds me one of the very first episodes we did of the show, we had uh, illustrator Von Glitchka on and he was talking about um, advice he had received about you get the kind of work that you show. So when you have a portfolio that shows these kind of things, you know, that's the kind of work that you're going to attract. As opposed to the early days in my firm, when the phone rang, we would just say yes to everything, <laughs> which got us in trouble quickly. You know, we sort of got out of that rut before long, but, you know, early on, you're just so hungry and it's tough to tough to turn things down. I'm curious where, where the name Attaboy comes from, you know, related to your, the types of work that you do. Um, you know, it's really a job well done, you know, and I think that's, that's really the ethos of the company too. Um, it's, you know, whatever we do, whether it's a title animation or like two seconds or 20 seconds or 20 minutes of work or content we create, I think it's at the end of the day, we can all look at each other in the eye and like, okay, that's a job well done. You know, I think the word attaboy, you know, perfectly uh, sort of summarizes that uh, without having to say much. Yeah. Love it. Um, so from a little bit of uh, stalking that I've done of you online, you guys have a New Zealand connection. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, that that's uh, very interesting. Uh, we have partner uh, in New Zealand called Circus, and uh, it's really there's a freelancer that we're working with, and uh, Scott, and he uh, was partner at Circus back in the day, and then he moved to America. But when he was working with us, he really said, "He said, you know what? You should meet." Um, you know, the guys who are at Circus, they are really an extension of you guys. Like you guys work in a similar way. You have the same thought process. And, you know, I think that, so they just made a very casual connection and we chatted, uh, we pitched on some jobs together. Uh, we won some jobs together. And then eventually I think it just felt natural to sort of, you know, make them an extension of ourselves and make us an extension of them. Uh, just in a way where it feels, uh, you know, very symbiotic. So, you know, we have an extension of team there and the, the talent, I mean, they have is amazing. They are such great animators and directors and their sort of visual aesthetic is on point. And, you know, I, I think our ethos and, you know, theirs really was make it not the same. And I think that's really what struck me the most personally is like, you know what, these guys have their head in the right place. They are not like one trick pony and neither are we. And we like to explore, you know, whether is them creating like an Airbnb spot, uh, you know, just out of miniatures. And, you know, I mean, once you see that, you know, spot, it's just mesmerizing and beautiful. And uh, it's just that creativity that they bring to the table, you know, that really helped us a lot in um, this partnership. You know, one of the other things that we mentioned in the introduction was, you know, we're, we're still on the tail end of COVID here. Uh, as we're recording, it's June 1st, 2021. And, uh, you know, this was a really big issue for people all over the world, obviously, but for production companies in particular, being able to film in person and have other people there in person. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, how the your CG element helped you through this. You know, immensely. I would say like that, that was the biggest advantage I would say we had over traditional production companies was we were sort of hybrid and we were able to 
you know, not only pivot, but, you know, bank on our expertise in CG and create the same narratives that would have otherwise been, you know, they were concepted to be live action projects. But because of what we bring to the table, we were able to brainstorm with uh, agencies, with clients, and, uh, you know, figure out what would be an alternate way of telling the same story and, you know, still come across as powerful. And, you know, we had a lot of briefs. Uh, you know, there are so many briefs that came like, oh, we we were going to shoot this in live action, but now we can't do that. So we want to recreate this in CG. Um, you know, there are some of them we entertained. A lot of them we did not because just the concept did not lead itself into animation. So again, to your yeah. point, we were able to pick and choose uh, where the concept led itself to animation, and we were able to create some, um, you know, really beautiful work. Uh, I'm like particularly proud of the Adidas job that we created. Uh, the Adidas uh, as this initiative that they are, uh, you know, making their leather. Um, not vegan, but just made more sustainable and earth friendly. And um, we were able to tell that story uh, without actually shooting a single thing. Like we were able to recreate photoreal stylized animation um, just uh, straight without a single plate. And, you know, sometimes uh, at least my, my opinion, as I was looking through some of your samples, Things like the Airbnb spot where you're kind of going through the city or the IKEA skyline ad, you know, where it's kind of this mix of architecture and live action and, you know, sort of still feels like animation um, you can really see like the architectural influence there. Is that is that an intentional piece of bringing that into the work? Uh, yeah, IKEA for sure. Uh, you know, IKEA. You know, obviously the concept was brilliant. The concept they wanted to make a New York City skyline out of uh, IKEA pieces. And we mulled over, you know, a few different ways to do it. Like, are we recreating these in miniatures and then shooting it? Obviously that would have been easier, uh, but just, you know, the iconic uh, IKEA furniture, you know, had to be assembled. We had to assemble the hundreds and hundreds of pieces of IKEA furniture to make that skyline. And, you know, how we positioned that, uh, you know, definitely had uh, architectural influences where we were creating negative spaces using, uh, you know, cabinets or like adding, you know, certain elements to create that spatial distance. And then the filmmaking aspect of it came into being where we decided to sort of do a motion control camera rig where we were able to just do the same thing over and over and over and then added complications by changing the lighting. So it starts off daylight and then ends as the iconic New York City silhouette. Mm. Well. So yeah, we you know definitely don't make life easy for ourselves. Um, <laughs> that's really what we love about it. Um, the Airbnb piece that you mentioned like that, uh, you know, the team at Circus, they really, it's all, all credit goes to them. It was a project that uh, originated there and their partnership with Ogilvy Singapore. Uh, and they really hit that one out of the park. I mean, that is just a phenomenal piece of work that it's, it's second to none. I think in the world of um, production companies, uh, it's not unusual for an agency to own the client relationship. So you guys end up, you know, assisting another agency with the client. Um, we talked a little bit before the top of the show about an agency called Markley in New York that you guys have done a lot of work with. Can you talk a little bit about what that relationship is like and kind of how that uh, has helped you guys do more together? Um, you know, one word to describe is friends. I mean, everyone at the agency are, you know, they're a fantastic group of people. And, uh, you know, we've sort of over the years built this bond, which is more of a friendship. Uh, and on our conference calls, it's literally, we, the producers have to rein us in saying like, hey guys, let's get into the project. <laughs> so it takes like, you know, 20 minutes to get into work, but but, you know, through social media and our close proximity in New York, like we are so, uh, we are close to each other. And, uh, you know, I think we all share, share like similar sensibilities. And, 
Yeah, it feels like a small family, especially working with them. So, uh, you know, more relationships like that, uh, you know, are great. And I think that's why, you know, Attaboy was formed to sort of force those relationships and keep those going, you know, whether it's with a brand or with an agency, like-minded people create work that, you know, uh, really uh is great because there's no egos like you're sort of you know uh vibing on each other's uh ideas and uh, you're really collaborative the goal is to make the best possible piece of content you know yeah that's cool um so you know speaking about your team in particular we've we've talked to people on the show who are one person solo shops and people who have you know hundreds of employees across the world and and everything in between. I'm I'm curious how your kind of size and staff is shaped and like is is that the 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 end game or is the goal to get bigger and just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on size. With the artists and collaborators, you know, uh, what we have in house uh just feels very symbiotic in a way where you have directors and artists that are part of the team have been with us for a while and there's a shorthand that uh, we speak and just the process gets super, super simplified as opposed to like having a massive team and that overhead again, you know, not having to feed the machine gives us the flexibility to pick and choose on projects we can take as well. So yeah, we have animators, designers, uh, producers and directors in house that sort of make up our core team. And then, uh, we freelance out, uh, additional people, um, especially the variety of work that we do. Like, you know, it's so varied. Like there's cell animation, there's CG animation, there's, you know, live action. So it just, it's impossible to, uh, you know, have all of them on staff. Uh, and so to produce like really high quality content, we, we concept it and we get it prepped for production internally with the core team and then hire a SWAT team to execute it. Yeah, cool. Um, I can imagine with your architectural background um, that you may have some different influences than a lot of other people in the production and CG world. Um, but I'm curious who are some of your influences and maybe some of your design heroes either you know, coming up in the biz or people you look up to currently? Yeah, I, uh, you know, in terms of uh, influences, I'm like hugely, like you mentioned, influenced with architecture uh, and influenced by architects, um, you know, notably Zaha Hadid uh, was one of my, you know, major influences growing up and, uh, you know, quite contrast, contrasting uh, Mies van der uh, you know, he, just the structure and uh, the precision um, that was used to create the art form, the build form, um, it's just, it's, it's really breathtaking. And, you know, the space is like once you, you know, enter a building uh, that is so structured that it feels like a box from the outside, but the thought process that, you know, the light and the, you know, the air circulation and the view and the minimalism furniture, um, you know, brought on by Mies and the, you know, institutional scale with this organic forms that saw uh, Hadid builds. I think they're both have been my major influences, whether it's like design or, you know, architecture, just in general, they're definitely my heroes. Yeah. Love that. Um, you know, another question that I used to ask our guests early on, and I learned that there's no such thing was, you know, what's a typical day look like for you? So with that in mind that we know the answer is there's not one, <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about the types of things that you work on throughout the week and, and like what mix of things you're working on, uh, typically. Oh God. Uh, yeah, it, it really depends, uh, on the day. Like you said, uh, you know, running my own company and, you know, being part of it creatively and in the production, um, it ranges from anything, uh, doing treatments, which I do a lot of for, you know, new projects, uh, directorial treatments, um, to just, you know, 
you know, getting together with the artists to see where the current production is and, you know, creatively how we are able to keep the vision uh, alive and going to, you know, make going over bids and calendars with producers to talking to business managers about where we are. It's, it's like a mix of everything. But, uh, you know, come seven o'clock, I'm pretty much goofing around with my kids and causing trouble. <laughs> that, that's the consistency. Well, I'm guessing that last one is maybe your favorite thing in the day, but like out of the, out of the things you do at work, are any of those something that you get most amped up about? Yeah, that, you know, family definitely, like it gives you that sort of energy and, you know, gives you the motivation to do what you do, you know, five days a week. I think it's those three hours you can squeeze in the day keeps you going for the other, you know, 10 hours. And, you know, however exhausting it may be, I think my, you know, wife and my kids, they definitely uh, keep the fire in me going. And, you know, at the end of the day, however shitty or the great day was like you sit at a table with them and you know, that's what really worked for. So, you know, that's human behavior. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe this will be a harder one to think on, but do you have any proudest professional moments that you'd like to share? Um, yeah. Uh, I would, I would say starting Attaboy actually, uh, you know, that's cool. I was very proud of myself. Uh, I'm proud of uh, my parents that sort of, you know, gave me the power to uh, power of thinking to pursue my dreams and, uh, you know, do what I felt was right. And whether it is, you know, um, DJing when I was younger and encouraging me to, you know, DJ to like joining arch doing architecture or, you know, starting Attaboy, I think, you know, they, I definitely have, um, a, a lot of my upbringing, you know, makes me the person I am. So just going out and in a country I was alien to starting Attaboy and being able to, you know, professionally be where I am is definitely one of the proud moments. Uh, what do you think is next for you guys at Boy? Is there anything that you're, you know, adding to the mix or dream projects or anything cool in the works that you can tell us about? Uh, you know, most importantly, next is to figure out when we can all start working together. Mm, yeah. That's more important. But uh, is most of your team in New York? Uh, yes. Most of our team is in New York. Yes. Um, I, you know, we are definitely our next challenge that we want to undertake is, uh, you know, real time animation or virtual production, as they call it, or, uh, you know, rendering. And we are, tr we are internally trying to see, obviously, people are doing it, but how to take it mainstream and work within our pipeline where it is integrated in a way where it feels seamless. So combining DCC applications like 3D softwares that we use with real-time technology and, you know, how to sort of marry them together, um, especially the kind of projects we do where it's combining live action and animation. I think it's more applicable, you know, for someone with our aesthetic because, you know, I mean, there are so many shoots. We either have to build out huge sets or use green screens or, you know, and then go out and create in CG and then come back and be like, oh man, like, you know, it could be so much cooler if we could have done that, but we didn't have the budget to, you know, get a camera, go high up enough. Um, but like if the virtual, you know, production, I think that's definitely possible. So that's really, we are very excited about um, experimenting with that and, uh, you know, creating um, a new way of working. Do you have any dream clients or dream projects that you want to do in the future? Uh, Apple. <laughs> 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 yeah. Everyone wants to work with Apple. Uh, no, I, I mean, I feel like we take each project and clients uh, as they come. I think each project uh, provides their own sort of unique set of uh you know, challenges that I think gives us the opportunity to improvise and innovate as the project goes on. And, you know, whether it is a shorter time frame than what it would take or, uh, you know, just working back into a, a you know, a 
poorly funded job, but keeping our vision intact and how we are going to make that happen. I think, you know, there's innovation at every level happening. So, um, but again, working with a brand that aligns with what you really, really, you know, stand for, I think that's really great. So, um, yeah, I think any any brands welcome uh, as long as our sort of, you know, ideologies align, you know, we are happy to be working with them. You know, I, I always like to ask people, I don't always get a chance to ask this question about like, like what drives you nuts in your industry? What's the thing that sticks out that bothers you? But you had one that you mentioned, and if you've got another one, you're welcome to do that too. But you mentioned this in the bio of like hipster content that is like ironically bad aesthetic. Tell us a little bit, like unpack that concept for us and, and why it bothers you. You know, it just came about like a few years ago. I would say like five years ago. It's just like, you know, same generic sort of concept of, you know, people like riding a bike in Brooklyn, you know, with their pants folded up and every tech company, every brand wanted to sort of, you know, it's just like very, it feels very stock. Like those kind of mm-hmm. imagery has no personality and, you know, it all started with, you know, I feel like DSLR revolution where people, you know, had access to a camera they could shoot video with a very short lens. So you could have like really beautifully shot footage with zero emotion. And I think that really <laughs> is, you know, like the person really is not emoting. It's just going from point A to point B and you're, you know, it's like you're taking these beautiful shots. Like they, they look really great, but you know, now like they're just part of stock library. Like you can find millions of those shots and there's nothing unique about it. And that's, you know, that's why I said like hipster content is like, Oh, cool. I have a video camera and I can, you know, make this footage look really cool. Um, but uh, I think conceptually there's no deeper meaning to that. And I think that that really bugs me. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> Are there any, like working with a new relationship, new client, or someone who's asking you to pitch, what are some red flags for you guys, things that stand out that when you hear those things or see those things, you know, it's just not going to be a fit? Um, You know, the first call, the creative call that we have, um, you know, a lot of times that dictates the fact that, you know, whether it's a creative fit or no, uh, you know, whether it is the way they describe the project or, um, or a lack of it. And, uh, you know, someone saying, make it really cool, man. You know, I think like something like that is just like, okay, that's, that's a big red flag because, you know, I think you're trying to, it's almost like birthing a child and, you know, you're trying to sort of create personality in this content or, you know, trying to sell your product. Um, and just like make it cool does not cut it. And that, that's definitely like a big red flag. And, you know, again, like most, a lot of times, you know, uh, what I call them, um, champagne content on a beer budget. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so they'll see something and they're like, yeah, we want it to look just like that. But, you know, we are coming to you guys. Uh, because, you know, obviously the original creators, like, I don't think we can afford them. And I think that's a big red flag because there's nothing original about it. And, you know, they're just finding someone to, uh, rip other people's work. And I, you know, I think like that makes it really hard as creators to sort of digest and, you know, try to, because that's what really they want. And no matter how far you skew from it, they'll keep pulling you back into that. So, you know, we've gone down that road in the past. Uh, I won't say we haven't fallen into that hole, but, uh, you know, now from experience, we've learned like when something like that happens, it's just like no go. Is there anything that you do um, kind of as habit or, um, you know, process that when you fall in a hole, when you have a, a project that doesn't go like you want or, you know, how do you get yourself or the team motivated and kind of back in the zone? Um, you know, a lot of times, like looking back at the original pitch deck or treatment helps a lot for the team, like just sort of, you know, going back to where we started and, you know, minus all the comments or feedbacks, um, just like say, okay, we went, we set out to create this thing 
and here we are, like how close or how far it is from there, what led us here, and you know how do we get it back on track and collectively as a team, um, you know we just try to narrow down what's possible to, you know I, I wouldn't say salvage, but you know get the project back to where you know we really envision it and. Yeah, you know, going back, architecture has a lot to do with it. Like when you're starting to build a building, you know, it's on paper first and, you know, then you start building it. So, you know, you follow the plan, you follow the dimensions, you follow, uh, you know, the specifications and you get exactly what you design. So this is a question that I've asked every guest who's been on the show and your answer can be anything. It doesn't have to be production or, you know, cinema or even architecture related. Um, you know, I find that we creatives are often obsessed with many things, which is where we got the name of the show, (laughs) but I'm curious what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Right now. Um, I want to say like authenticity, like I'm really, uh, you know, as more and more, uh, again, like age might have something to play with it, but as you mature and, you know, you look at stuff, there's, there are trends and then there's, you know, a voice. And as long as the voice is authentic, it doesn't have to be on the current trend. It, it'll, it still cuts through the clutter and, you know, comes across. And I think as a storyteller, uh, to me, that's very important. You know, uh, you can sugarcoat it, you can do whatever, but it has to feel authentic and the soul has to come across on screen. And that's that's what we really try to uh, promote um, all our artists and collaborators to do is to, you know, try and, uh, you know, get that sort of authentic uh, thought process onto their work. Yeah, I like that. Um I'm curious if uh, if you guys couldn't do Attaboy Studios tomorrow and couldn't go out and make more cool spots, what would you be doing? Oh, geez. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know any better, to be honest. Like, just, <laughs> uh, you know, creating, uh, creating these sort of moving images is what I've done for in the past 20 years. And, uh, I'm not the kinds that can be on the beach, read a book. Um, you know, I would be tinkering and, uh, yeah, this, this is really what I want to do. <laughs> I like it. Uh, that sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> so do you have a favorite piece of advice that you've received? Like one that you kind of hear in your head all the time, or, or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you pass along to your team? Um, for personally, um, you know, I think just, uh, this one piece of advice I got from my managing director when I was working at Red Car, and this is when, you know, you're just making enough money to, you know, uh, survive, um, you know, and, you know, she said like, um, I'll give a shout out to her, Jennifer Letterman, uh, if you watch this. But, you know, she said uh, it was really just a hundred dollar bill, I think, as a, you know, like a Christmas gift or a bonus. And this was my first sort of full time job. And she said, don't go out and buy a new pair of boots with this. Do something meaningful with it. And I think that that is very important, you know, like it's and I money is figurative in this case, but every opportunity, you know, that you get every moment that you get, I think it's important to do something meaningful with it. Um, You know, whether it is, you know, talking to you right now, um, you know, or, uh, you know, going out and creating work. I think if you are just sort of in the moment and doing it so that it makes a difference to your life or others. I think that's very important. And that's really what we try to do. I like it. You know, that was along similar lines to what I was going to ask you next. So you can say I already answered that if you want to, (laughs) but do you have any encouragements or asks of our audience? Anything you'd like to maybe challenge them with? Um, Yeah. Do something you're uncomfortable with. I think that's something that I always tell people, uh, you know, especially in our industry and field of design, 
uh, is that you sort of can fall into this rut of doing something that you're most comfortable with. Uh, you know, try to do something that you're not familiar with or uncomfortable. Like if you don't like typography, you know, try to create art just using typography. And I think like that sort of will open up your, you know, mind to so many possibilities. And I, I really think as, as designer, you have to be, I would say like ambidextrous, you know, you should sort of work with whatever mode uh, of whatever um, palette you are served and you should be able to create art that you can stand behind. Yeah. Love it. Uh, before we let you go, um, tell our fans, our listeners where we can find you online and learn more about Attaboy. Yeah. Attaboystudios.com um, and at Attaboy Studios on all social media. So yeah, come check us out. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact me there. Um, you know, happy to chat more or answer. Well, Vickal, it's been great talking to you today. We'll definitely uh, post links to some of the things we talked about today in the show notes and, you know, references to a couple of your, your spots as well. So thanks for being on the show and thanks for being obsessed with design. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Okay, kids, that's episode 164 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and get ready to bring your design skills to win. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.